is often this idea that vegan food will naturally be something where you're denying yourself the, the pleasures of, of food on a sensual level. And so it's always been really interesting to me to be able to show people how, how wrong that is and that we can do things with texture and flavor and senses that, that the pleasures of eating food, you still get all that with vegan food for sure. There's a huge variety of food that you can eat if you're abstaining from animal products. In fact, you'd be amazed at what kind of things you can find even just in your local environment that taste amazing, that don't have anything to do with, with animal agriculture. You can find examples from all kinds of different cuisines from around the world that you can pull inspiration from where there's vegan food that is just a natural part of everyday life. They use the, a lot of different vegetables and tofu and different kinds of soy products, tempeh fermented things, miso, it's another kind of stir fries and curries. Um, it's getting easier all the time to be able to go out and enjoy vegan food in a, in a restaurant setting. Um, there's places opening up all the time and even in places that aren't fully vegan or vegetarian, they're more and more catering to um, people with that diet as it's becoming more and more popular and taking off. SAF is a, a very busy restaurant. We can often easily do like, 200 people in a day and it was voted by Time Out as one of the top 50 restaurants in the city in, in 2009. So for a vegan restaurant to be in that category is pretty impressive. And so our clientele and the people who come here come from a variety of different backgrounds. There's obviously a large sort of vegan and vegetarian contingent, but you get people who have no knowledge of those types of diets who are just curious and want to come and experience what the food's like and check it out. I don't consider it more difficult in terms of creating really good food on the plate. It's fundamentally not different in that sense from meat-based food. You do find though that across in, in a vegan restaurant, the chefs themselves are often much more engaged and passionate with what they're doing because the way in which they got to that place involved their own personal beliefs and philosophies more so than in a traditional kitchen. Fatih came here from Munich just before I arrived here. As a head chef, obviously, you know, he's got a lot of things to take care of, but he is open to discussing what's being done and, and how can we make it better. I started work in Safer Bar four years ago, and after that I decided to be vegan, and I give up everything in one night, and I feel the difference between the old days and now. So I'm much more healthy, and I don't need to go back to eat this kind of animal products anymore. So actually, stuff changed my lifestyle. People love our foods and they always keep asking to open the second one. We have lots of vegan and organic wine, so if you have a good baked tofu, you can get nice red wine. Normally, if you're making risotto, you have to use some chicken stock, veal stock or beef stock, whatever, but I just use some mushroom stock or vegetable stock. I think it's the most popular dish in restaurant now. Lots of Italian people is coming back after that experience. They say it's a beautiful risotto, delicious risotto. So I'm happy with that. Working in a, a vegan restaurant as a chef at the level we're trying to work at is really exciting because there's the sense that we're trying to push the boundaries and do things that haven't been done before and sort of be at a level that's respected as just restaurant and just food and then people will come here and just enjoy an amazing meal and then on top of which it's entirely plant-based. Um, and we get, we get a lot of good feedback and a lot of people are really excited about the meals that they had. And so it's sort of rewarding to be able to have that impact and be able to show people what's possible. I have a very, very active lifestyle. I'm a retained firefighter. I'm on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I always have to be armed and ready to go at all times, as well as my training. And I can honestly say that I never feel inadequately catered for on a, on a vegan diet. I started running predominantly to raise funds for animal charities and I started to win races and I decided that the ultimate goal would be to run a marathon. Um, I entered my first marathon in 2000 and I won it and from there I just decided that this was a way forward to help more animals and to promote vegan diet. Training for a marathon is not just about going out and running endless miles, it's about doing speed work, it's about doing a lot of endurance work and coupling the two together. So you've got to be fast, but you've got to be fast over a long distance. So I personally, and everybody's different, train between about 80 and 100 miles a week. 
I have complete 100% faith that my diet will give me everything that my body needs to perform well. I certainly don't look at meat eaters and think I could perform any better if I ate meat. I've run 22 marathons and I always produce a good run, no matter what. When I'm at a race, people are, you know, are quite surprised that I can do what I do on a vegan diet. And they say, why are you vegan? And um, I would say to them, well, why aren't you? Because after all, I've just beaten you. So perhaps if you try my diet, you might be up there winning races too. And on one particular occasion, the person who presented me the award was the Lady Mayoress. And she actually said that her daughter had been wanting to go vegetarian for quite a few months. When my mum was able to tell her that I'd been vegetarian since tiny and vegan since a teenager, she was really overjoyed that there was a role model there that she could use. That's a, a bigger achievement for me because that's somebody growing up. And then she's the future and veganism is the future. No alcohol, no weed, no cigarettes, no ease, no milk. No cheese, no eggs, no meat, just meditation and peace. Red lentils, chickpeas, good workout, good sleep, more sunshine like breeze. I've been working for the NHS for over 15 years now and it's wonderful because when I get patients sent to me who are overweight or got heart disease or high blood pressure, I can talk to them about all the plant-based foods they can eat that make them a lot healthier by cutting out all the saturated fat and high salt foods in their diet. Wow. Recommendations now by the Department of Health is to go towards a more plant-based diet with the encouragement to have five portions of fruits and vegetables a day. In my opinion, omnivores can be lacking in lots of vitamins and minerals and, and nutrition generally. If you look at the obesity, look at all the fast foods, they're the kind of foods that vegans just wouldn't entertain eating at all. And certainly studies have shown that vegans are less at risk of heart disease, type 2 diabetes, and things like hypertension. So certainly a vegan diet encompasses all those health benefits as well. And I feel really fit and healthy. I love my food and I do love having treats. And the benefits from a vegan diet is that it's low in saturated fat. So you can have all these treats and you know you're still going to be looking after your heart. People often are concerned about calcium, which you can get from fortified foods, and vitamin B12, which you can get through things like fortified non-dairy milks, some soya products, also from some yeast extracts. Whether you're vegan or a meat eater, you still need to make sure you have adequate quantities of vitamin D. The main source comes from sunshine, from the sunlight on your skin. So get adequate sunshine or have fortified foods containing vitamin D. And we get quite a few queries about parents or pregnant women who are concerned about getting the right nutrition for their children and for their unborn child and certainly we can assure them that they get all the nutrition they need through a planned vegan diet and I've written a book for the vegan society about vegan infants it starts from conception through to infancy and hopefully parents are reassured that they can get all the nutrition they need for themselves and for their children I've been vegan for six years and when I became pregnant friends asked me are you going to stay vegan surely not sort of thing and I didn't have any pressure from doctors or midwives everyone seemed very happy for me to stay vegan it wasn't a problem at all I, I read a lot about being pregnant and I knew everything that I was supposed to be eating and so it was absolutely fine I was very active and fit during my pregnancy the pregnancy was great I quite enjoyed it <laughs> and she was nine pound three when she was born so she was a pretty big baby Without any dairy or meat, you know, I managed to produce a very beautiful, healthy baby and everything's been great. I've felt very healthy and strong and fit since I've had her. Breastfeeding hasn't been easy. It's made me respect other animals' milk even more and made me feel strongly that I don't want to ingest any other animals' milk because their milk is meant for their babies just as my milk is meant for my baby and it just seems completely wrong that adults of other species should be drinking milk that's not for them. 
I've been very lucky. I think she's a very happy baby. She's not had colic or any digestive problems. And some people have told me anecdotally, they think that's because of my diet, that I'm not eating anything which upsets her digestive system. So I would really advocate um, staying vegan and being confident about being vegan because I do believe it's the best thing for your baby as well as for you. Labour MP Kerry McCarthy and this morning we're going to be talking about global food security, the environmental concerns surrounding food production. Well I think people just need to be very much aware of the impact of the Western diet on the environment as well. I mean some people will become vegans because of health reasons, some because of concerns about animal welfare. But I think increasingly people are beginning to look at the impact of industrialised farming and the fact that we just cannot sustain a Western style diet. The world's population is predicted to grow from 6.7 billion at the moment to 9 billion by 2050. And even if we don't have those levels of population growth, even if we stick to current levels, Levels. It's estimated that if everyone adopted a Western-style diet, we'd need three planets the size of Earth in order to sustain ourselves. A vegan diet is very sustainable because on average it requires a third of the water and a third of the land to produce a vegan-based diet than it would to produce an animal-based diet. And that's because farmed animals eat much more protein than they produce. Most of the protein that they consume is used to actually to, to live, to keep themselves warm, to repair injuries, rather than to actually what you could describe as grow milk, eggs or meat. More water and land is therefore needed to produce cattle feed, for example, which leads to deforestation, um, scarcity of water supplies, soil erosion, and the pesticides have a damaging effect on the environment as well. So we need to explore ways that are less harmful and wasteful and have less impact on our environment and on our natural resources. Some people ask me, well, what would happen to farmers' livelihoods if we all moved to a plant-based diet rather than animal-based? But obviously, if people did do that, they would still be consuming crops that are actually grown by farmers. So there'd be a role for farmers to play to move towards a more sustainable way of farming. I live in the countryside and I see how much of the land, its potential, is just not being used. I mean, in Hampshire, a lot of the land is devoted to stables and horses. So we could actually... Um, change the land use to, to benefit the wildlife, the planet, the animals and us. A lot of people ask me, would the landscape look monotonous without livestock? I mean, I could say that we've actually created an artificial landscape which was more diverse before with trees and wildlife and we would actually encourage the diversity of crops. We would be seeing orchards of nuts and fruit. We would encourage a lot of understory uh, shrub layers of soft fruit a great diversity of vegetables and cereal crops. It would actually be a much better mixture of, of crops instead of huge monocultures of acres and acres. Because of the diversity, you would get more habitat for the wildlife. It would actually encourage the wildlife, which is under a great, great pressure with the current conventional farming. The bees here are, are very important. They actually uh, operate at much lower temperatures than honeybees. They come out earlier and they, and they feed later. So you're getting good pollination. I know also here there are three species of parasitic wasp, which means that you have a reduction in caterpillar numbers, which cause a great deal of damage to cabbages and broccoli and kale. And hardly any, any damage is seen here. Uh, the hedgerows are kept very, very um, thick. They're not cut every year, so they're richer for wildlife. And they're also connecting um, annuals between the hedgerows across the fields, which act as um, beetle banks and, and wildlife corridors. What these methods do is they actually benefit the biodiversity. You have more predators which keep a balance. You don't have the pest and disease problems. Could we manage on a plant-based diet in the UK? A lot of work being done with agroforestry uh, is showing that uh, we could have a lot of the crops growing here that we're actually importing at the moment. And a lot of things could still be grown outside. We wouldn't have to have heated greenhouses. And even just with the polytunnel, like we're seeing here, it's surprising what you can achieve. We have now several stock-free, commercial stock-free farms like this one. Um, we know that these, these methods work. Stock-free organic farming is a system of food production which excludes any animal byproducts or any dependence on animal inputs at all. 
it's not just about growing crops, it's also about the way we interact with what goes on you know, within nature around us. We've been doing it now for 15 or 16 years. Um, it's working very well, people are very happy with it. I mean, it's nice to have people back on the land, working land, and everybody's more than happy to be doing it. We've developed a system of fertility building, uh, which relies very much on green manure. So we're using plants to produce nutrients, which are fixed from the air to improve biodiversity, uh, and not relying on importing somebody else's land to support our fertility, which is what most conventional and organic production is dependent on. So we, we've kind of designed this system which is more or less independent of exterior forces. And because we're building carbon in the soil, this is particularly important, um, and a very small increase in organic content in the soil uh, has a huge effect in terms of carbon entrapment. In fact, this is one of the biggest carbon sinks possible soil. So it's not only good for animals, it's also very good for carbon capture, which is obviously good for climate change. So we're building organic material, and the only way to build organic material long term is through plants. You cannot do it through manure, because manure dissipates into the environment very quickly, it gets broken down. Whereas plants, they leave roots in the ground, which gradually decay and become carbon. In here, there's actually four different types of green manure, yeah. four yeah. different plants, all doing slightly different things. Uh, but all building fertility. And the, the, the final outcome of this is a, a soil which is very friable, good, uh, good population of worms, yeah. easily worked, doesn't take as much energy to work soil yes. when it's in good yes. condition, yes. and uh, very good for plant roots. So yeah. this, this forms the basis of fertility for future cropping. For future cropping, yeah. yeah. We grow a whole range of crops, 70 different types of vegetables almost 300 sowings a year, almost one sowing every day on average. So it's making the best possible use of land to feed people, which is really what farming should be doing. Um, and I, I do very much hope that there will be a move, a transition from the conventional type of agriculture we have now to uh, a stock-free agriculture in the future. Stock-free farming uh, could support people in developing countries as well as here. Um, the same techniques would be beneficial. We would actually not use the vast amounts of water, land, food to support the livestock. We would actually create more tree habitats, making a difference with climate change. It's been interesting looking at the way the environmental debate has, has developed. I mean, initially people thought uh, carbon emissions, that's about the energy we use in our homes or it's about the amount we drive or the amount we fly. But increasingly people have realised that, that food and the environment are so closely interconnected. And there's been a growing amount of research which is saying actually the way we eat and what we eat and what we throw away is, is having a significant impact uh, on the environment. Every step of the journey from the, the field to your plate is, is creating carbon. It, it could be anywhere as high as 18% sort of, of greenhouse gas emissions is caused by the meat and, and dairy products we eat. Compare that, say, with the aviation sector, which is only 2%. So, you know, there's a tenfold difference between the aviation sector uh, and the food sector. We, we only have one planet and, it, and it's a defined size. There's only a certain amount of arable land and a lot of that's being increasingly degraded through animal agriculture. These in Australia, certainly hard-hooved animals and many other parts of the world are degrading the quality of the land and we need to be very careful with the way we farm in order to make sure that that land uh, is there to sustain us for future generations. Cattle in many countries in the world outnumber the people. The cattle themselves produce a lot of waste, they require a lot of land. Methane is produced from them, which is a huge contributor to global warming, one of the most significant. And for every kilo of meat, an increasing proportion of dung goes onto the land. In, in the US, as the FAO report says, that's one of the primary causes of water table pollution. In the Amazon, uh, the vast majority of deforestation is being used for cattle farming and much of the remaining is for soya protein which is used as cattle food. Um, so without, without this relentless drive to produce more meat which is a, you know, a high profit product we would have more Amazon which has been called the lungs of the world. 
In addition to its contribution to climate change, you have to look at species loss. You have to look at um, the native people who live there and so on. Uh, the number of birds, the number of animals that live in a given area of forest are essentially wiped out by it being converted to forms of agriculture. It, it's like someone going into the Louvre in France and just smashing it up. I mean, it, it's mindless and, and, and it's just so unnecessary and, we, and we're destroying something that, that, that can't be replaced. There are a host of things we could do that will have a really significant effect on climate change as a society. Things that we're looking at are things like transport, our energy supply, and, and then you have the way we use animals. Given that global livestock production is causing more greenhouse gas emissions than all forms of transport put together, I think we're confronted with a question. Do we totally re-engineer our energy and transport systems, or do we just give up eating what I think are often unhealthy and cruel products? There's also the case of fish stocks. Most of the major ways in which fish are caught uh, are fairly unsustainable. We have things like drift net fishing, uh, which is completely indiscriminate and catches every sort of fish in the ocean. Then you have trawling, uh, which trawls the ocean's floor, um, reducing plant biodiversity, destroying reefs. And people often say that fish farming is a um, sustainable option, but actually an even greater number of fish are required to be caught from the wild in order to feed those fish. I have a number of friends who, who say, well, what if we raised animals in a more ethical manner? The Omnivore's Dilemma is a very famous book um, where that's his conclusion, is that he can move to the country and raise his own chickens and his own, his own animals. It's a lovely concept, if you like the taste of meat, but it's just not going to sustain six billion people and growing, uh, which is the world's current population. I've always been a vegetarian my whole life, and um, so I've always respected animals to an extent. My boyfriend challenged me to become a vegan because he's done the vegan challenge for a month. And um, I was inspired. So I, I went into it with full enthusiasm and I got all the benefits. I felt good about myself. I got lots of vitality. I lost weight as well. And um, I'm proud of myself and I'm more than anything proud of the fact that no animal is harmed by what I eat. And that's what I think veganism is about, living in harmony with everybody. Our thinking about non-human animals is very confused and people that have chosen to lead a cruelty-free, plant-based lifestyle are baffled as to why other people have not made a connection. Many of us live with companion animals such as dogs, cats and rabbits. We share our homes with them, consider them members of the family and we grieve when they die. Yet we kill and eat other animals that, if you really think about it, are no different from the ones we love. This is known as speciesism, a prejudice against members of different species. Most people don't question their habit of eating animals as they've been brought up to believe it's normal behaviour. But causing suffering should never be considered normal. According to the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, humans kill approximately 56 billion animals for food each year, and this doesn't include fish. This quantity can only be achieved by factory farming animals, which can lead to diseases such as bird flu, swine flu, BSC and MRSA. Antibiotic resistant microbes are the result of the overuse of antibiotics. Over half the antibiotics in the UK are given to farmed animals, not humans. And farmed animal diseases can spread to humans. Behind windowless walls, it's easy to turn a blind eye to the horrific reality of factory farms and slaughterhouses. You may think this footage is old, that things are not like this anymore. Wrong. This is exactly what it's like. And what happens to the farmed animals who live outside is not too dissimilar. Free-range chickens will usually be slaughtered for meat at 8 weeks and organic at around 12 weeks. People see cattle and sheep grazing in fields and think they're okay, but they'll also be sent to slaughter like all animals bred for food. Factory farmed and free range animals are treated as commodities and their individual needs or preferences are not respected. And it's not just to produce meat. Every year millions of farmed calves and chicks die in order to produce milk and eggs. 
Male chicks don't produce eggs and are not profitable for meat production, so are killed the day they are born. And laying hens, when their egg production starts to fall, are also killed long before their normal life expectancy. It's no fun for cows either. In order to produce milk, the dairy cow must give birth to a calf. As soon as the calf is born, they form a strong bond with their mother. Yet within a few days, they are usually separated, causing extreme distress. Male calves do not produce milk and are usually shot at birth or sent for veal production. And the female calves are added to the milk production line, like their mothers. Three months after the loss of her calf, while still producing milk, she is usually made pregnant again. She's put through this exhausting procedure three or four times until she too is deemed redundant and killed. More than 20% of dairy cows sent to slaughter have been found to be pregnant and the skins from these unborn calves is used to make soft suede. Many people assume that leather is an incidental element of the rearing of animals for meat. It's not. It's used to produce shoes, jackets, wallets, gloves and furniture and so purchasing leather goods helps make the rearing and killing of animals a profitable concern. Just as we have tried to end racism, sexism and ageism, we can also try to end speciesism. Enjoying a plant-based diet and vegan lifestyle is the ultimate protest against animal exploitation. It's taking action every day to reduce animal suffering and death by decreasing the demand for all animal products. I don't like watching the animal cruelty footage, but by us watching it together, we can make a difference. We can empower ourselves by being educated what is going on and then change it. With the mounting evidence, Compassion, our health, the environment, water pollution, supporting developing countries, food security, rising population, sustainability, the rainforest. When people ask, why are you vegan? Perhaps the question should be, why aren't you? Please, make the connection. I like being able to abstain from the, the negative aspects of food culture and be able to celebrate the positive ones. Becoming vegan does not mean just changing your diets, caring about animals and global warming. Also, you are changing your lifestyle. I feel wonderful being vegan. It's the best thing I've ever done. If, if we want to have a lower carbon diet, we should be eating more vegan food. I think there's misconceptions about being a vegan, which stops people exploring it, investigating it, seeing it as a possibility. In my opinion, the real reason people eat meat and dairy is because they like the taste of it. When you look at the evidence, is that taste really worth it? The case for veganism is so strong on a number of fronts, from the animal welfare point of view, from the health point of view, and from the environmental point of view, that I would never go back. Food when I was pregnant was very easy. They tell you not to eat all the things that already weren't in my diet. It was brilliant. People would say to me, oh, are you having trouble, you know, cutting out cream cheese? And it's like, no, because I don't eat it anyway. I feel that change has to come very quickly. Uh, time, in a way, is not on our side, but we know we have the solutions in place. Um, we know that Stop Free Organic works. So whether people are concerned about developing countries, the environment, their health or our fellow creatures, becoming vegan is an active, positive and compassionate choice. Yeah, I suppose maybe I do feel pro, but I don't really feel about it, but I feel lucky more pro, I think. <laughs> for the future, I hope that more people respect each other, care for the planet a little bit more and respect animals a lot more and just try a cruelty-free diet.